One of the more disturbing medical procedures remains to this day an important, potentially life-saving treatment. Amputations, that is the surgical removal of a part of the patient's body. These procedures have long been carried out, with varying rates of mortality throughout the ages. In today's video, we will cover the brief history of amputations and how the practice has improved over time. It is perhaps helpful to start with an explanation as to why amputations might be needed. This procedure can be used to remove limbs affected by infections or gangrene. If left unchecked, the infection or gangrene can spread throughout the body and cause death. Sometimes, a person's limbs may be damaged by severe trauma, such as crushing or an explosive accident. The limbs can be damaged to such an extent that they cannot be saved. Some amputations are not done for medical reasons, but for punitive reasons. Amongst many cultures, the removal of a hand for those caught stealing, or the removal of a foot for those considered lazy, are commonplace. Such extreme punishments serve not only as a deterrent, but also seen to curb reoffending. One of the more disturbing examples can be seen in the Congo Free State. Belgian King Leopold II used forced labourers to extract as much rubber as possible. Those who did not meet the quarters would be killed, with hands taken from the dead as proof. This was done by enforcers, but many of these enforcers did not wish to waste their limited bullets, and instead, they took to cutting off the hands of labourers or even random people as proof of their enforcement of these quarters. Hands even became a form of grim currency, traded where there were shortfalls in rubber collection. Sometimes amputations were a form of control, perhaps best seen, in the use of eunuchs. In China, the practice of removing a servant's or slave's penis and testicles served a particular social function. Some were trusted to look after the emperor's harem of women, without risk of an heir born by another man. One of the earliest known amputations has been found in the caves of the Kurdistan region of northern Iraq. Remains of one of the Neanderthals showed evidence of amputation, dating between 35 and 65,000 years ago. The individual had signs of deformity, and there was evidence of the removal of his lower arm and hand. This Neanderthal even recovered with signs of healing. What's more, he would not have been able to look after himself, meaning that he was cared for by either his family or his community. It was not until ancient Greece and the father of medicine that amputations became somewhat codified. Hippocrates believed that amputation should only be carried out when the patient was suffering with gangrene, but only as a last resort for the likes of battlefield injury. He wrote in his essays titled On Joints that the surgeon was to cut to the bone just below where the skin was already dead and not to cut away any of the live flesh. One of the main dangers in amputation is the loss of blood, and whilst the ancient Greeks did have knowledge of basic tourniquets, cutting live flesh was not something that they were prepared to deal with. Hippocrates also believed that there didn't need to be any closure of the wound, and argued that boiling water could be used as a means of cauterizing the exposed flesh. Of course, during these times, there was little in the way of antibiotics, and antiseptic care was limited to wine and vinegar. Many would not survive these operations, and many more would die during recovery. The next major step in our understanding of amputations came with Celsus, a Roman encyclopedist, who learned so much by recording medical knowledge that he was regarded as a physician. He believed that not just dead flesh needed to be cut away with an amputation, but also live flesh too, allowing for a cleaner cut. He argued that the bone needed to be cut shorter than the wound, and that a flap of skin be left to cover the wound. The wound was to be packed with lint and soaked in vinegar as an antiseptic. Much of what he argued is still in some way done in modern amputations. During the European Dark Ages, much of what was learned about amputations was lost and forgotten. And yet, during the Middle Ages, amputations were needed more than ever. With the advent of cannons and muskets, amputations were needed more and more. Rather than a simple slashing or stab wound, cannonballs could destroy a person's limb. Whilst musket balls, if not properly removed, could lead to infections. For those with leprosy, amputation was often the treatment employed. So too was it used for those suffering with ergotism. 
Ergotism is a disease often caused by ingesting a fungus that grows on rye or wheat. If the fungus is ground up into a flower and consumed, it can lead to truly disturbing symptoms. The symptoms include psychosis, loss of the senses, and can lead to gangrene. Those who survived this disease would often have their gangrenous limbs amputated. The rise of what was known as the barber surgeon was the next attempt to relearn amputation practices. During the Middle Ages, monks and holy men were often physicians, but they would not carry out surgeries as they were not permitted by doctrine to spill blood. More specialist surgeons would deal with the more intricate operations, but for the dangerous and dirty tasks, the barber surgeon would be the one to deal with it. Amputations in particular were done by the barbers, who, due to their skill in wielding knives to cut hair, were seen as the perfect choice. In addition, they carried out bloodletting and tooth extractions. A barber surgeon would play a major role on the battlefield, dealing with amputations of wounded soldiers. One notable barber surgeon was Ambrose Paris, who served a number of French kings during the 16th century. One of his notable innovations when it came to amputations was a rejection of cauterizing the wound. Instead, he favored ligatures to tie off any severed arteries. His work with injured soldiers led to the writing of his book, where he detailed the phenomenon of the phantom limb. Many soldiers who had limbs amputated retained a feeling of pain in the limbs that were no longer present. Parry correctly deducted that such phantom limb pains occur only in the brain. The importance of antiseptic in saving lives in amputation was massive. One rather interesting application can be seen during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Prussian surgeons embraced the use of antiseptics, going against the prevailing scientific consensus of the time. As a result, their injured soldiers recovered from their wounds much faster than the French, and with fewer complications. It was even documented that injured French soldiers would surrender to the Prussians, hoping to be healed by their surgeons rather than their own French doctors. It should not be forgotten that at this stage, there was little in the way of pain medication or anaesthetics. Patients would often be wide awake during the amputation of their limb, held down, whilst the surgeon did his work. Some of the earliest forms of anaesthetic included a sleep-inducing sponge covered in opium and mandrake. Other times, alcohol, ice, or even violence to knock out a patient unconscious would be used before an amputation. It wasn't until the 19th century that ether started to be used as an anaesthetic and a pain relief. Diethyl ether, or just ether, is a colorless, highly volatile, sweet-smelling, flammable liquid. Specialized inhalers would be used to ensure a patient received a dose of ether or even chloroform before amputations. It was in 1846 that surgeon Robert Liston carried out the first amputation using ether as an anesthesia. This allowed for a much quicker surgery. During the American Civil War, amputations were extraordinarily common with an estimated 60,000 amputations performed on Union soldiers alone. This accounted for around three quarters of all surgeries conducted during the war. During this time, the use of a soft-leaded bullet called the mini-ball resulted in devastating injuries. The mini-ball expanded upon impact, shattering bones and tearing through tissue. This, coupled with artillery shells, resulted in horrific injuries. The conditions in field hospitals were chaotic, and many attempting to treat patients found themselves overwhelmed. In some battles, there were tens of thousands of casualties. Bacterial infections quickly spread, and amputating was usually the only option. During the American Civil War, around 750,000 soldiers were killed. This number could have been even higher if amputations were not performed. Due to amputations, all manner of prosthetics have been used over the years. Early prosthetics were often made of bronze or wood, bound to a person with leather straps. But this changed with the barber surgeon Ambrose Perry. He designed functional prosthetics based on the human anatomy. The limbs he designed would for example include a mechanical knee that could be locked when standing and bent at will. He even developed a prosthetic mechanical hand, operated by catches and springs that allowed an amputee to once again hold the reins of a horse. 
but today prosthetics are made from more durable and flexible materials like carbon fibre. Prosthetics can even be controlled by using the electrical signals from the amputee's residual muscles, allowing for better movement and better control. In this day and age, we are rather lucky. Just imagine for a moment needing such a procedure, being held down whilst a man with a saw hacks into your skin and bone. You can either die from infection or go through with this horrifying procedure. Between the traumas of war, disease and workplace accidents, amputations have long been a part of human history. As with many medical procedures, our understanding and capabilities have significantly improved, along with the ways of offering prosthetics. The disturbing history of amputation is one of the horrors inflicted upon so many.